السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله If any time you can here just, just raise your hand and I'll try to speak louder inshallah but uh, I want to start by saying that it's uh, a blessing and honor to be with you here today and especially uh, in this blessed month of Ramadan I don't know uh, if you didn't look on your way in make sure you look when you go out but quickly a, a reminder that the full moon is is out now right so that's that's half of the blessed month so uh, if we've been there in the beginning and we're getting the mid Ramadan blues or we're fatigued it's uh, it's time to turn on the afterburners and, and get hungry again remember every night Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is selecting servants to save from hellfire and to enter among his righteous servants uh, don't let uh, the person on your right and left be awake and, and working hard and so on and so Allah selects them and, and he misses you and I mean he leaves you and you're right there in line because you're waiting for next year or waiting for tomorrow or waiting for the 27th and join the crowd right let's uh, inshallah yani stay with it uh, this, these are the days of mercy and blessings I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to turn in mercy and blessings to all of us and our families Allahumma ameen I'm really excited about the topic today. It's timely. Uh, it's important. Uh, the concepts of charity in Ramadan are intertwined. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was described to be the most generous of people in general. But then he was especially described that he was never as generous as he was in Ramadan. And the Arabs had an expression. Uh, when you translate it, it sounds really wacky, but let me try. It says that he was like an unrestricted wind. Oh, what's that? It means he was giving and giving and giving in Ramadan. It means that it, the goodness that he was spreading out couldn't be contained. You know, sometimes when you're walking in Washington, D.C., or in your favorite city, and it's really windy, especially if it's cold, when that, that uh, building is by you, you're, sh you're sheltered. And this is really nice, especially in the, uh, in the winter. Maybe in the summer we want some uh, wind. But then when you walk out to the intersection of roads, you, you feel this breeze all of a sudden just coming like it's in a tunnel between those two buildings. The Prophet ﷺ, his giving was like this in Ramadan. To everybody, to the people he usually gives to, to those that, that are asking, to those that aren't asking, all of the good causes he would give. ﷺ. And I really uh, praise the, uh, the MCC Young Adults uh, organization and also all of you for coming out today because this feels like an iftar with, with a purpose you know iftar is full of blessing in general to meet with family and friends but really to come here and emphasize that today I'm not going to eat except that I help someone else eat with me right and inshallah two people and inshallah more inshallah you know we're not satisfied with just the admission uh, you know ticket price for coming in but we give more and more this is really the Islamic concept of charity. And today I want to review with you, I know you're all fundraisered out, right? So you know, oh, first he's going to speak, and this is not to take anything away from these verses, but you know, you've heard that the, that the one who gives, and don't, don't let the repetition make it become routine. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ The likeness of those that give their money in, for the sake of Allah is like... What? Like a piece of grain that becomes an ear with 700 grains. Each of these has the same p potential. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies for whom He wishes. But today, I want to really take these verses beyond the fundraiser level. And talk about beyond pushing ourselves to give charity. The Qur'an really has a cohesive message. And many Muslims actually don't fully appreciate a really central message of the Qur'an about giving and charity. It's, it's, it's about more than pushing you to give more in the fundraiser. It's about more than giving zakat. In fact, our scholars have, have explored the Qur'an and explored the religion and actually suggested levels of those that give. So don't think that giving is just, you know, charity or no charity. No. Giving in Islam is levels. Some are above others. Some are satisfied with where they are and some are, are going higher and higher. Because really, 
giving is one of the special ways that the servant draws closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're going to today live those levels with a great story of the Holy Qur'an. Believe it or not, many of you memorize this story but don't know the story. In other words, you know the verses, but you don't know that there's a story behind them. And I am the first among them. I memorized these verses years and years before I knew what this story was. It is an incredible story, though it is not a famous story. It is a story related in Juz Tabarak, Juz number 29, Surat Al Qalam in particular. Anybody know the story I'm talking about? It's a central story with a central theme about charity and giving. Anybody get it? There's only one story in Surat Al Qalam, that's a major hint. <laughs> this is the story of Ashab al Jannah. The companions of the Jannah. But it's not talking about that Jannah. Actually, the Jannah of the hereafter, linguistically, has a root in the Arabic word meaning a garden. But there's many Arabic words for garden. Hadiqa, Bustan, and others. So Jannah is like the premier gardens. They're not normal. And so the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used this word to describe the gardens that were beyond our conception. So he chose the highest word we have to describe the best of what we have in this world. So these people had a garden that was happening, right? They called it the Jannah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it Al-Jannah in the Quran. Although it's on earth, actually people have suggested exactly where it is and I'll come back to that at the end of the story. Our story is about a father who has three boys. This father started as a very average man. He wasn't rich, he was actually very simple. He started like, like many of us started, or our parents started, without that extra edge, without the major inheritance, just trying to make a living. And so when he started, actually, this man did not have obligatory charity upon him, most likely. Because there's, there's, a, there's a line below which you don't have to pay zakah because you don't have. So this man likely started in that company. But he started to build himself up financially until he started to grow. But as he grew, this man's giving and charity grew. And the Qur'an honors him with mention in these holy pages for this act of worship above all others. This is his trademark, his stamp, if you will. But I mentioned to you giving is levels, right? So the first level is to recognize that giving is an obligation. Uh, by the way, not giving zakah is like not on the ladder, right? That's, that's below level one. That's, like, that's in the negative territory. And, and it is very sad, actually, that many, many people have done research to show definitively that there is no way that present poverty levels correlate with a Muslim ummah that's all paying zakah. They've done this locally, they've done this on the level of regions. I'm talking about scientific studies. And I don't think that the United States is exempt from this. Many, many Muslims don't give zakah. Many Muslims. And this is the obligation. This is, uh, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's right. And by the way, it's two and a half percent of gross or net for money. It's not a trick question. Net, right? So it's much more generous than uh, taxes and a number of other obligations you have on your money. But this zakah is a pillar of Islam. And the person that doesn't implement it is really destroying a pillar of the pillars of his religion and the pillar of, of her relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he started at this level, recognizing that as he was given by Allah, that he must give. But charity is levels. Some people are happy with the bottom rung, and some people want to ascend. This man was a man that wanted to ascend. And so actually, as he got money, he ascended to a higher level. And that was the recognition that giving in charity 
does not decrease from your wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that وَمَا أَنْفَقْتُمْ مِنْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَهُوَ يُخْلِفُ وَمَا أَنْفَقْتُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَهُوَ يُخْلِفُ That whatever you give from the good that you have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces it. And brothers and sisters, I, I mean no offense certainly, but to leave no room for doubt, I'm not giving you a spiritual high talk. Wallahi, look for people, they will tell you, I have seen with my own eyes, this verse happen in front of me. The verse doesn't mean that it has to happen that moment. It doesn't mean that it has to be money for money. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you might give money, He might save uh, you, know, you from a sickness, or, or, or give you things in this life and the hereafter. But people have seen for sincerity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finds in their hearts, he, they have seen these multipliers of 10 and 70 and so on happen in front of them. I saw it once, not for me, but for a, a, a person, a brother we expect inshaAllah and hope that he's among Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's righteous servants and I hope to catch up to him, Ya Rabb. But actually, this brother, he had a, a, a payment due the day after what I'm talking about, and he had nothing, nothing to pay this loan. And it was thousands and thousands of dollars. That night, there was a cause from the causes of good that they were looking for donations. And so it seems like this person, you know, he couldn't make the debt anyway. So obviously if you have a debt, you pay that first, but he had $10. So he said, you know what, it's hopeless anyway. Let me give these 10 for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the span of less than 24 hours, 70 times what he gave found its way in cash to him and he paid the debt dollar for dollar, cent for cent, less than 24 hours after that charity. So that second level is not to think and again, I have to be honest with myself, because I know my heart comes up short. It's not to think that, oh, charity, you know, doesn't decrease from wealth, is a fundraiser line. No, this is a truth. And this is really a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to move us towards charity. So we're ascending with the man. And as we ascend, we have to mention Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu who captures for us a meaning that helps us realize that this isn't the top rung of the ladder. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed many verses in the Qur'an with the meaning, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يُقْرِضُ اللَّهَ قَرْضًا حَسَنًا We've all heard these verses, right? It's not only one verse. Who is it that will give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a, a honorable good loan? Right? Because we're talking about this exchange Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returning in like many times over in this life and the hereafter. All the companions are so excited. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected us and imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepting from you. This is incredible. As uh, Sayyidah Aisha mentions, that when she was asked why does she perfume the charity that she gives, before she gives it, she said, I know that this charity falls in the hand of Allah before it falls in the hands of the needy. So that, that concept of this being something, an exchange with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for Abu Bakr, he cried. He cried. So companions were absolutely shocked. Why are you crying Abu Bakr at this beautiful verse? So Abu Bakr said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understood our greed and so he gave us the verse in terms of a loan of an exchange Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has only to ask and we will give this is uh, I told you some people aren't, aren't happy with the first and second rung although these are Muslims and believers some people are hungry for, for nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the season and the month that facilitates those that are seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, a higher level of charity 
and a level that we ascend to with this man is what? Is that all of this belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, spend of the money that He has appointed you as a, as a, as a protector or governor of. In other words, this, this money is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, it's not yours. He just gave it to you under your control for a time. So that he would test what we would do with it. And this man is ascending to that realization, this money isn't mine in the first place. Every day we recite in Al-Fatiha, though I fear that the, that the meaning may not penetrate our hearts. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين Master and owner and sovereign over the last day, the day of judgment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions His sovereignty and specifies it with the last day because that is the day that no one, even somebody totally out of their mind could claim sovereignty and ownership over the last day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the sole sovereign and powerful over that day. So also it extends to this life, which is less than that. That the ownership of human beings is temporary and transient. And the ownership of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is per permanent, everlasting, deep and unquestionable. So whatever clothes we wear, whatever cash we have in our pockets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala owned it when they were plants, owned it before they were created, owned it when it's on our bodies, and will own it after another people use it after our death, or after it decomposes into dust like we do. So it is a realization that this dunya is a tool in our hands that it should not overcome our hearts, and should not turn us from the true, the true master and owner of everything that we have. There are other stations, but these are three that we've highlighted that were ascending with this man. Until this man became very rich, and so we have the namesake of the story, the Jannah. He had gathered enough wealth, and he purchased a piece of land. This land was very yeah, ripe for growth, very, very full of, uh, and, and he planted it and cultivated it until it became full of fruits and full of goodness. This man didn't forget his roots. And how many people taste power or money or authority and it escapes their mind whatever poverty and difficulty and so on that they faced before. Look, from the level of, of, of presidents and rulers, I am always shocked to find some of the most tyrannical rulers were once upon a time living in mud huts in the village and unable to find tomorrow's food. And yet power and authority, and I'm talking about people that are alive, and, and recent, real rulers, I'm not talking about ancient history. And pick that for your masjid, or pick that for your home, or pick that for any authority that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us. Money is corrupting, but only in the minds of those that hold it in their hearts, not in their hands. And one of the important conclusions we must walk out of today, is that as Americans, often we feel this guilt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us, whereas others are tested with poverty and with hunger. But a more reasonable conclusion is to recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tested them with poverty and constriction, and He has tested most of us with ease and plenty. And how many times are the tests of plenty more difficult than the tests of poverty? This man did not forget where he came from and did not let the money in his hands make him lose sight of what he was here on this earth to accomplish. If all of the Muslims were poor, although there are exemplary, exemplary poor and simple people in Islamic history, but if all of the Muslims were poor, nobody could invest in the projects and, and things that were needed to build civilization and to help society and to work 
from the, the, the acts of goodness that the community needs. And one of the, the, the biggest incorrect stereotypes of the companions is that they were all poor. This could not be further from the truth. Among the companions are exemplary poor people, like Abu Huraira or Bilal. And among them are people that the scholars have said if they lived amongst us, they would be millionaires. Like Abu Bakr and Omar, or Abdurrahman ibn Auf, who the companions described, he could sell the, the sand of the desert for a profit. Not out of oppression, out of skill at his trade. So as this man, a message that I think is relevant to us, is not to feel guilty if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, but rather to feel responsible. And not to lose touch with those that are poor and needy. The apathy and the guilt that we sometimes experience is amplified by another dimension that is especially difficult to face here in the United States. It's that we are so sheltered and almost, you know, so far removed from those in need that you start to f forget what it feels like to help a human being with your own hands. Most, a lot of charity now is credit cards, right? So you, you put your numbers in the field, you fill out your name and your address. It's no different than, you know, buying your favorite food or clothes on Amazon. Then you click on submit, and the following page is a long paragraph thanking you, lest you get offended and not donate next time. So they speak about your generosity and how thankful they are, and that it's 501c3 tax deductible. You can ask for all their forms, and you will be able to take the deduction. I'm not saying taking anything away from this, but the meaning of seeing a person in front of you in need has an effect on the heart. The act of giving by credit card is important, but the act of, of giving or stretching out your hand to someone in need is also important as well. Or serving food. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامِ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ They feed people out of His love. I'll tell you a story, and then we'll close with the story of uh, Surah Al-Qalam. Uh, I used to have a big problem, and I'm going to share this with you honestly. Uh, Sometimes, especially those of us that live in suburbs and so on, you start to encounter those that you encounter that are homeless or in need. As you look deeper, it seems like all or most of them are lying. I remember once walking out of the metro and somebody was, was uh, asking me for money. I said, I'm sorry, I don't have any. And I really didn't have anything in my pocket at that time. I wasn't carrying any cash. I walked to my car, I found some change. It was a sizable amount of change. It was enough for him to complete the, the trip that he said he was dying to make. So it wasn't my habit, but I felt a need to give. So I walked back, and this is like a you know, 15, 20 minute round trip. I'm, I'm just, it's nothing special. I'm just saying it was a conscious decision that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me with. Then I walked all the way back to the car. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that I had dropped something and I had to walk all the way back to the metro. There was a man with a new story and pocketing my change. He didn't have somebody in the hospital or whatever cuckoo story he sold me. This has happened to me several times until I've started to doubt the need to give somebody who's asking. So we start to think that all people who are homeless or don't have are lying. And I'm not telling you, you know, I, of course I encourage people to give through organizations and, and to be careful where you spend your money. But I learned from a brother in Boston a brilliant thing. For a while I stopped giving. And then I was walking, it was a freezing, cold Boston night, and it was raining lightly, and we saw a person, he asked for $20. The brother I was with said, I don't have $20, but I'll buy you a sandwich if you'd like. He said, no, 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 I'm, I'm hungry. He said, yeah, I know. I have one right here. I just walked out. I'll go buy you a new one. But I just walked out. We were literally two steps down from the restaurant. No, don't, do you have $20? He said, I have it in food. If you'll take it to feed the hunger you want. I love the idea. 
And so I tried it. For three years, I offered everybody who was hungry to buy them food. I never had a person take me up on the offer. Until one afternoon, I know you guys think I'm building up to a climax. This is actually a sad ending. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just to warn you. I was praying dhuhr, and I was substituting for the imam in the masjid, leading prayer. So a man that I didn't recognize walked up to me with a note, and it said basically his story and that he needed an announcement for donations. I prayed. I did not have the authority to make the announcement. I was substituting as imam. So I didn't make the announcement. I walked up to him. I told him, I'm not the imam. I don't have the authority. And I can tell you the policy of the masjid is that all donations have to go through the zakat committee. But as a personal act, having nothing to do with the masjid, I will buy you lunch. He said, yes, brother. I really want lunch. Well, like first time in three years. I'd been trying. I'd been waiting for this person. The problem was there's no restaurants nearby. I told him, I'll get you lunch, but you have to wait here 10 minutes. I left, and I have to be honest with you. I don't want to stand up here and act righteous when I'm not. In my heart, I said, there's no way he's going to be there when I come back. <laughs> I really did. But I had to fulfill my promise. I went. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, this is something small. Sometimes you take a step to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah facilitates a path you weren't planning. I walk in, it's lunch hour. The place should be crawling with people. The entire restaurant, which is very popular, is empty. Nobody's there. I was shocked. I walk in, the owner of the restaurant is there. He walks out. Gives me an incredible, walks to me and says, incredible welcome. He's like, what would you like? We have this, we have this, we have this, we have this. But you know, I want you to go get from the buffet. Take as much food as you want. So I went, and I thought if I was really hungry, what would I want to eat? So I started putting the food, and I came. He looked at me, he said, you know, you don't have to pay. I said, no, I have to pay. You don't understand what this is for. I have to do it. <laughs> he said, okay. But then take this and take this. And he starts taking water and drinks and so on and piling it and a plate and extra utensils and a bag. And don't think he knew me. He doesn't know me at all. This is not, has nothing to do with me. Two strangers. I walked back and the brother was still there. I gave that food to him, half of me was soaring out of the joy of bringing a small happiness to another person's life. The other half of me was depressed because I realized I couldn't remember the last, person I fed, the last person I fed with my hands. I thought for all of that afternoon, I could not grab in my memory the last time I fed somebody with my hands. That was needy. So, in addition to the obligation for charity, we also as Americans have to build that ability and that courage not to be guilty, but to use what Allah has given us as a tool, but also to change another attitude. Not to wait for the poor to knock on our doorstep. We have to leave our comfort zones and go to the people in need. And I'm so proud, Yani, of, of the idea that was brought together today, one for one. Inshallah, next time it will be one for ten. Inshallah. And we'll be finding opportunities to go. You know, as we gave money and other goods today, Inshallah, I know uh, the MCC Young Adults is planning a service trip so we can have the experience of going somewhere and doing something with our hands. Because this strengthens the meaning of charity. Uh, you're wondering what the end of the story is. There's so much more to say, but time gets the best of us. So, this man, at the end of his life, he did something incredibly fair and beautiful. His garden is thriving. And so he split it into three pieces. A third for the poor. 
And it was the best third, not the worst third, right? Not the rotten apples. And No, no. The best of his wealth. لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You shall not attain righteousness until you give of that which you love. Not just the worn out clothes, not just the out of style fashion that looks like it's from the 60s. No, to give of things we love. Because we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. A third was for his family. And a third was invested back into that garden. Very, very fair until the man died. Unfortunately, the children didn't live up the legacy. And that is the verses that start. I encourage you to go back and read them, Surah Al Qalam. I think it starts verse uh, 17. Inna balawnahum kama balawna ashab al jannah. إِذْ أَقْسَمُوا لَيَصْرِمُنَّهَا مُصْبِحِينَ وَلَا يَسْتَثْنُونَ We tested them as we tested the companions of the Jannah, which are now the children. When they swore by Allah, the meaning of the verse is that they would pick all of the fruits before, righteous, before ripeness, so that no poor person would have a chance to eat of that garden. And they would let them ripen in the basket. We're all used to this because that's the way we buy our, our fruits from, uh, from the supermarket. Right? وَلَا يَسْتَثْنُونَ Meaning they would leave nothing. Everything. They said, what's with all, this old man, you know, giving and all this nonsense? We worked hard for this, this is ours. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, we won't have time to go through all the verses. So they went to sleep and they said they would do it tomorrow morning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَطَافَ عَلَيْهَا طَائِفٌ مِنْ رَبِّكَ وَهُمْ نَائِمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, a company, a party from your Lord encompassed it while they were asleep. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't specify fire because it's more than the fire we know. Doesn't specify a, a disaster because it's more a disaster than we can comprehend. And it was while they were asleep, the verses continue, and I've seen what the scholars have suggested as the land of the Jannah. Now, this is thousands of years later. This, this story happens before the time of the Prophet ﷺ. It is so sharp that if you walk on it barefoot, you will cut your feet. When you hold it, it's not like clay. We have clay soil around here. It's rock. It's rock, but it's soil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of their, their greed, turned one of the most ripe places of land to a totally barren place until the Day of Judgment. The Qur'an scares us and we should be fearful of the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it also opens an invitation for those that will race to their Lord and give in charity. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this blessed month, that we are giving like the wind as our Prophet ﷺ gave, and that we feed the hungry, we clothe the needy, that we shelter those in need of shelter, we help the oppressed, and we give from the good that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Allahumma ameen, ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.